Well, hi, everybody. My name is Mark Graven. I am the VP of Improvement and Innovation Services at Kinexus, and I'm very happy to welcome you to today's webinar titled How to Coach for Creativity and Service Excellence. And uh, I'm really happy to be joined today uh, by Karen Ross, who is going to be our presenter. So before I introduce Karen and hand things over to her, which is talk about some of the logistics for the webinar today. Um, so Karen Ross is our presenter. She is uh, an experienced lean consultant coach and practitioner. Um, re fairly recently, the book came out, um, I believe, last year. She was the co-author uh, with Jeff Liker of um, the book that won uh, the Shingo Research and Publication Award called The Toyota Way to Service Excellence, Lean Transformations in Service Organizations. So Karen has worked in a lot of uh, different sectors, service industries, insurance, finance, HR, transportation, and retail. Um, she's going to be talking today about how to combine um, creativity with lean practices to ensure the best service, what they want, when they want it, with the right personal touch. Um, she is an artist, as you'll see uh, in her slides, and um, we are going to be giving away uh, a signed copy of a piece of artwork um, that I think you will see here uh, in the slides. So with that, um, welcome, Karen. I will hand things over to you. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much uh, to you and Kinexus for hosting me. And thanks also to everybody who's uh, joining us today on the webinar. Today we're going to talk about how to coach for creativity and service excellence. And anybody who knows me knows that it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, having spent many years both in customer service and in coaching and teaching others how to coach to create and deliver the services their customers want now and for the long term. Now, I'm sure that everybody on this webinar is just as passionate about this topic as I am because many of you probably work in customer service or in a CI role in services. And even if you work in manufacturing or in a continuous improvement role in manufacturing, every single one of us is a customer of more than one service process, I'm sure. We all purchase items in retail stores. We have cable and phone service. So if we aren't currently passionate about service excellence, we certainly should be. Today we're going to cover what service excellence is and isn't, what creativity is and isn't, why I believe that in order to change our mindsets, what we need to do is change our behavior first, not the other way around as many people commonly think, how we can develop our own and others' creative problem-solving ability in 15-minute daily coaching sessions, and finally, how we can use creativity and the Toyota Way to Service Excellence principles to deliver peak services for our customers. So let's get started. Here's where we're going to start, and it's where we always need to start which is deeply understanding what our customers want now and for the long term. So, what do today's customers really want? In my estimation, they want three things. The first is lean processes. They want what they want, when they want it, right the first time, no hassle. No one has patience to wait anymore. And not only do today's customers not have any patience, they don't want to get a defect, they actually want the process of ordering and receiving the service to be hassle-free. Have you ever tried installing your own software or had to call a help desk for any reason? I just spent 40 minutes last week online with a uh, travel provider, and you can be sure at the end of that experience, what I wished for was that I had an easy button. That's not enough, though. Today's customers don't just want what they want exactly when they want it right the first time. They want what I call luxury experiences at coach prices. And Uber is a really good example of this. Customers expect a clean car. They expect a well-dressed driver, water and snacks, and a place to plug in all of their devices, all for less than half of what the price of a regular taxi ride would be. And finally, if you thought that was enough, it actually isn't. Today's customers really want caring, human, personal, real connections. Although it's quick and easy 
to um, interact with an app or send a customer complaint by Twitter. What people really want in service is to connect with another live, real human being. So think about it. How many of you absolutely love to call a service provider and have the machine voice say to you, don't worry, I can understand full sentences. Or even better, how many of you really love to be put into that phone tree where the machine voice says, mm, as it puts you on hold. Thank you for calling. Your call is very important to us. None of us enjoy that. And I'm not surprised. That's because we're all human beings. We're not machines. And service is actually about other people. So in order for something to be a peak service experience, what today's customers all want is it has to be what the customer wants, their way, now, and with a personal human caring touch. And when we can provide that, we're creating and delivering service excellence. So now we've come to consensus about what today's customers do want. Let's spend a few moments talking about what they don't want. What I say today's customers don't want is ever to hear the words, I can't. Customers hire our service organizations to serve them, to give them what they want, when they want it right the first time. What they don't want to ever hear is the service representative they're talking to answer their question and their request with, I can't. So the question really becomes, why, as customers, do we so often have to hear what I call the long list of I can'ts? I can't help you because my system is down. I can't help you because our system doesn't do that. I can't help you because we currently don't offer that service at all. Or my personal favorite, I can't help you because I haven't been trained on how to do that yet. Or in my training, I was told not to do that. Like the example we had a couple of weeks ago when my husband wanted to have a glass glass for water in a restaurant, which he could see right in front of him, but he was told by the cashier that he could only have a plastic cup because the glass glasses were only for people who ordered beer. When I asked the cashier why he couldn't have a glass glass, she said that she had actually been trained that way. So the question that I want all of us to think about during today's uh, presentation is um, if customers never want to hear, I can't. Why do they? And why do uh, they have to hear it so often? That's going to bring us to the topic of creativity. Because in my experience, the reason people say I can't is because they think they don't know how to do something, that they aren't able to do something, and they don't have any way of figuring out how to do it. Whatever the I can't is, it seems to be currently impossible. I don't actually believe in that, though, because so many of the products and services that we once thought were impossible, they're now actually commonplace. Think about 30 years ago, 40 years ago, what would someone have said if you would have explained to them that you were going to carry around a small handheld computer, it had a phone in it, and it had a camera in it? They would have thought that you were crazy. Yet today, all of us carry a smartphone. I believe that we say I can't because in general, figuring out how to do something means two things. First is that we have to have an idea of how to do that something differently. And then we have to have a method of actually turning that idea into reality. And having an idea about how to do something differently involves being creative. Unfortunately, most people I know don't think that they're creative. When I'm doing a presentation or a workshop and I ask people to raise their hand if they think they're creative, do you know what happens? Well, most people look away, or they look down at their feet, or they pretend they haven't even heard the question. Very few people raise their hand and say, yes, I'm creative. And that's actually the saddest thing to me, because I believe that as human beings, we're all innately creative. We just were born that way. So 
let's take a look at what I believe most people think the definition of creativity is. Flashes of inspiration that come out of nowhere, lightning bolts that come down from the sky, something that happens to other people, but definitely not them. I do not believe that definition of creativity at all. So here is the Karen Ross definition of creativity, and I hope that you will all um, take away from this presentation and adopt this, and that is that creativity is simply combining previous knowledge and or experiences in new ways to generate ideas about how to do things differently. I am sure that every single person on the line today has previous knowledge about a lot of things and that they've gained that knowledge from a variety of experiences. And since this is the case, I can guarantee that every single person on this webinar is creative. And that's a really important concept because since customers never want to hear the words I can't, what we need to do as coaches is not just coach people on solving problems and using lean tools. We need to coach them to rediscover their ability to combine knowledge and experience they've gained previously to generate ideas about how to do things differently, which is exactly what we need to do to create the peak services that our customers want. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the difference in approach and thinking between solving problems and continuous improvement and creating peak services and experiences for our customers. So we'll start with solving problems and continuous improvement, which is a very common approach we'll find to lean thinking and learning and culture change. So in this approach, we start by thinking if, if a customer has a problem, we need to fix it for them. And in order to fix it, what we need to do is find the root cause. And this often leads to convergent thinking. Convergent thinking is actually narrowing many possibilities down into a few. And there's actually a problem with this approach because it's really, in some ways, the opposite of creativity. In this approach, when we're searching for the one root cause, we tend to do it by breaking things down into smaller and smaller pieces, looking for that one needle in a haystack that's going to be the one root cause. And then, in order to solve that, what we do is we search for the one right solution or countermeasure that's going to fix that one thing. So this approach focuses us on breaking things apart instead of actually putting them together. So let's think about continuous improvement for a minute. Continuously improving seems like a good idea. Who wouldn't want to get better? But the question then ultimately becomes, who are we really getting better for? Unfortunately, the answer that I often see in this kind of approach is that there are a lot of efforts and programs that become internally focused, internally focused on continuously improving our end results and improving internal performance and processes. A way that we can often tell that is look at how the KPIs that are being measured and focused on are worded. So if we see wording like how can we increase customer satisfaction scores, how can we reduce number of complaints, we really can see that we're not focused on the customer. We're actually focused on ends, our own internal ends, um, rather than our customer saying how can we make sure that all of our customers have a good experience. So in solving problems and improving then, what we're really talking about is what I call necessity is the mother of invention kind of thinking. That means we've got a problem, now we need to fix it. We're not hitting our targets and making our numbers, so we better improve so we can do that. And to my mind, that's quite different than striving to create and deliver the peak services that our customers want and need. In my view, creating peak services and delivering service excellence involves looking at a long-term systems view. It's based on deeply understanding our customers' current needs 
and also working to project into the future what those needs might be. And it's based on a very deep commitment to our company's values and guiding principles and what our company is working to create in the world. So creating peak service experiences goes beyond solving problems and continuously improving our own internal processes. It actually asks us to listen deeply to customer needs and beyond and really invent the services and products and experiences that our customers might not even know that they need yet. And this is really important because if we as service organizations want to exist into the future and want to serve customers for generations to come, what we really need is what I call invention is the mother of necessity thinking. So again, thinking back to our smartphone example, 30 years ago, I didn't know I even needed a smartphone. Now, I cannot stop myself from going out and buying the next generation of the new phone um, as soon as it comes out. So, all well and good, you say. It's hard enough to even get people to learn how to problem solve and work towards continuous improvement. How could we possibly get them to be creative and strive towards service excellence? To address that, we're going to have to think about how we work with people to change. Most of the problem solving and continuous improvement methods and programs that I see focus on the idea that we need to change people's minds and thinking first, and once they're mentally convinced of the benefits, they'll decide to do something differently. And what's the something different they'll decide to do? They'll decide to adopt the new problem solving and continuous improvement methodology. They'll decide to change to a culture of continuous improvement. And in order to change people's minds first, one of the approaches that we commonly use is send people to training. When we send them to training, we give them a lot of information and theory up front, which is uh, a kind of batching, as I like to say. Once we've given them all of that theory and information up front, we actually send them back to their work area where we expect that they're simply going to implement, that, implement what they've learned. Only to find most often, in my experience, that they go back and continue to work just as they did before. Nothing changes. Now, this isn't really surprising to me because most people, even if they think something is beneficial, aren't actually able to change behavior on their own just because they've heard or think that something is a good idea. And you can just think for yourself, think about all the diet and exercise plans that you know have great benefits, and that you and I haven't been able to start or stick to no matter how many trainings we go to about them. Because as much as we would like it to, unfortunately, the theory first approach to changing behavior just doesn't work. Also, when we send people to training, in general, what we're doing is training them to make the same response every single time. So let's think about training animals for a minute. When my dog Karma was a puppy, we took him to dog training. And we gave him a command, let's say, sit. And we reinforced it with a cookie. And six years later, I am happy to say that every time we say sit, he sits. He doesn't do anything else. Of course he doesn't do anything else because actually he was trained to make one response only. And that's what training does. So oftentimes we're surprised when we send people to training that when they go back to whatever their work area is, they're not able to implement. But it's not surprising at all because the situation in most people's work areas isn't exactly the same as what it was in training. And because they've actually been trained to make the same response to a stimuli every time, they actually can't apply it to their situation. Their situation is just too different. And we shouldn't be surprised because actually that's what we've trained them to do. 
Making the same response each time is also what I consider another example of convergent thinking. So what we want is people to do the same thing, which trains them not to think of many different possibilities. And it goes along with another problem of training, which is what I call either or thinking. So in either or thinking, we have to do this or that. So instead of helping people learn to see multiple possibilities, we actually train them to do one thing only or another. In this case, whatever you've been trained to do, do it and do it in this case. But that's totally the opposite of the creativity needed to figure out how to do things that we think are impossible. So if training isn't going to help us become more creative so that we can strive to service excellence, what is? Well, what I've found is that coaching, daily interaction in which a person learns by doing with support, is much more effective. And here's why I found it to be much more effective. First of all, when we have someone else helping and supporting us, it's much easier to stay on track and do things differently. Second of all, when we do things differently, we see and experience different results personally. And seeing and experiencing for ourselves is what actually changes our thinking. So think about the last time you had help. Perhaps you hired a personal trainer or nutritional coach, or you just made a exercise packed with a friend, and you stuck to your diet and exercise program, and you lost 10 pounds. When you saw and experienced the result, you actually changed your own thinking. Oh, diet and exercise really does work. But you had to have that experience first before you actually changed your thinking. Another benefit of coaching is that the coach can supply small amounts of theory just at the time that it's needed. So let's say you're in Gemba coaching someone and they notice that progress isn't being made towards targets. Well, the coach can then ask, how are people able to see that targets aren't being met now? When the coachee answers, well, they actually can't, there's no way, the coach can then insert right at that time when it's needed theory about visual management. And finally, one of the greatest benefits of coaching that I've found is that it really enables and supports divergent thinking. And divergent thinking means we help people learn to generate as many ideas and as many disparate ideas as possible. So when a coach asks a coachee open-ended questions, the coachee has the opportunity to think of many different possibilities. The coach can also help guide the coachee to what I call and thinking. And that's when the coachee gives a response. The coach can simply ask, and what else could we do? And what else? Conversely, if the coach hears a lot of what I call I can't statements, they can make that visible to the coachee and ask them, what can you do? And this helps the coachee develop both their divergent thinking and a can-do thinking habit. So let's get a little more specific. I'm going to walk you through the approach that I actually use to coach for creativity and service excellence. So first thing I do is I schedule daily 15-minute sessions with my coaches. And I found the frequency of 15 minutes actually allows me to challenge my coachee to move out of their comfort zone into the uncomfortable learning zone. And that uncomfortable learning zone is where they have to be creative and try new things based on their past experiences and knowledge. 15 minutes a day also allows the coachee to feel supported and nurtured as they try. Um, as we heard before, when we have to do things on our own, we don't have a lot of success. Oftentimes, um, people feel they've been thrown into the deep end without a life vest. 
in 15 minutes a day, people always feel that I'm by their side. And it's really important to remember that when we're learning new things, we don't have confidence yet because confidence only comes from doing. So when I stay by my coachee every day, what they do is what I call borrow courage from me. And they need to borrow courage from someone because they have to do things that are new to them they, they don't yet have the confidence for because they haven't done them before. Finally, 15 minute a day sessions allow me as the coach to frequently check to make sure that the person I'm coaching is progressing along at a steady pace. And oftentimes, um, if we go longer than daily or if we put too much in our coaching session, we find that our person that we're coaching isn't actually making a steady progress, which is what we want them to do. So that's frequency. How do I actually help people and coach for creativity during those 15 minutes? So in those 15 minutes, I ask questions that are specifically focused on helping the person I'm coaching rediscover and develop their creativity. And the questions push the coaches to have ideas and figure out different ways um, based on their previous experience and knowledge. Now, anybody who actually has been coached by me knows that I don't accept, I can't, as an answer. So questions that I might ask a coachee is, well, how could we accomplish that? What other possibilities are there? How could we combine those ideas in a different way to come up with something else? And when I use those questions, I actually am helping people practice divergent thinking and generate their new, uh, generate new ideas so that they can figure out how they can. Once people have had an idea, they need to have a method to turn that idea into reality because having a great idea is wonderful, but if we don't actually turn it into reality, it's not going to be of any benefit to our customer, which is who we are striving to create the peak service experience for. So finally, during my 15 minute daily sessions, I help my coaches learn how to use the Toyota Way Lean Principles so that they can take the ideas that they've generated and turn them into realities, the peak services our customers need. And I do that by asking questions and inserting small amounts of theory, lean principles, and practices as needed. So a question I might ask around this are, that's a great idea. If you do that, how will it help, help flow value? Or how will it help us to see what's happening and determine good, not good? The coachee can then answer, and I can help them. I can help them to learn about waste. I can help them to learn about flow and pull and leveling. I can help them work towards setting up visual management. So instead of making lean principles separate things to learn, they're actually built into each coaching session and very naturally the people that I'm coaching learn how to turn their ideas into actual realities that fit in with our lean principles. Lean does not become something extra to do, it's simply the way we do our work. Well, all well and good you say, Sounds great in theory, but do you have an example in which you've used this in real life that you can share so we can hear about it and understand how it really works? So good question, and yes, I do. In Chapter 10 of the Toyota Way to Service Excellence, you can read the story of the three partners of National Taxi Limo, and National Taxi Limo is a startup personal transportation service, and their goal is to help their driver partners, and a driver partner is an owner of a small one and two car independent cab company 
flourish, thrive, and grow by becoming better business people. So National Taxi Limo created a vision of service excellence, and their vision of service excellence is every ride on time, every time working together. And of course, just like everyone else, Joe and his two partners in National Taxi Limo, Ken and Todd, they have had, well, they had, they <laughs> made a lot of progress, a lot of I can't thinking, and no way, that's impossible kind of responses, even when they thought something was a good idea, and it would be beneficial to their customers, their driver partners, and themselves. So one day, Joe came to me and he said, our driver partners are unhappy. And they're unhappy because they want to be paid within 24 hours, just like Uber pays them. Currently, we're paying them once a week. But they said, if Uber can pay for us every day, why would we drive for you? Why wouldn't we drive for Uber? Joe said, sounds all like a good idea, but there's no way that we could do it. Uber is a huge company. We're just a small startup. It's impossible. Really? I said, it's impossible. If Uber can do it, then clearly it actually must be doable. Yes, yeah, said Joe, but, and then I'm sure you can imagine the long list of I can'ts that Joe gave me, why National Taxi Limo, a small startup, couldn't do it. Great, I said. And I had Joe write down every single I can't. And in this situation, in a situation like this, I would suggest you have the person you're coaching write down every single I can't as well, because then they can see them. I said, go home tonight, write, write down a list of as many I can'ts as you can and bring them back to me. And in our 15 minutes, we'll talk again tomorrow. So next day, Joe came back with the list. And I just simply said, which one should we start with? So Joe chose to start with, our bank can't transfer money that quickly. So when we talk through that, I asked Joe to generate a list, again, ideas of all possible alternatives. And he said, well, we could change banks. We could talk to the bank and actually see if there's some solution they know how to do that we don't know yet. We could look into different ways to pay people or transfer money, not through the bank. Maybe we could use um, the payment app that we use. Maybe we could use the app that actually people schedule their rides through and the drivers use as well. So um, Joe generated that list of many different possibilities. And off he went to talk to his uh, business partners, Ken and Todd, and see um, if they had ideas and what could possibly work. So the next day, Joe actually came back. And he said that he and the partners had called the bank and they worked with the bank and found out there was actually a way to transfer the funds within 24 hours. But now they had come up with a list of whole internal organization problems in which their processes prevented them from uh, being able to do that transfer as well. So again, same process with Joe, 15 minute session, he thought about all the different possibilities and which, choose, which ones actually would fit in with our lean principles of flow and pull, which would cause over-processing, which would have the least amount of over-processing, which ones flowed value quickly and directly, and off he went to work on those again. So the end of the story is that after four days of 15-minute coaching sessions, driver partners were being paid within 24 hours. Something that just a few days before had seemed absolutely impossible. So end of story, driver partners happy, National Taxi Limo was happy, and they were happy because really they were striving towards their vision of service excellence. And Joe was particularly happy. And he told me, 
The reason why he was happy was that he'd gained confidence in his own creative ability. And he said, now I can actually take this thinking and apply it in other situations. And uh, many, many times in working with National Taxi Limo, I've actually seen Joe take that thinking and apply it to, to all of the other challenges that his business has, just like every other business. So, in conclusion, peak services are what today's customers want and today's organizations need to deliver. Service excellence is different than problem solving and continuous improvement. It's focusing on the services our customers want now and for the long term and how to create and deliver those services to them. I'd like you to really think about creativity and that creativity isn't lightning bolts that come down from the sky, great flashes of inspiration that happen to other people. And I'd really like to make sure that you come away from this webinar understanding that you are a creative person because what creativity is about is about combining previous knowledge and understanding in new and unusual ways and all of us have that ability. I'd also like you really to think about how do we change our thinking? And do we need to change our thinking first? Changing our thinking comes from changing behavior first. So if we really want to help the people we're coaching and the organizations that we serve, we really need to help people change what they're doing so that they can change their thinking. And finally, I hope you'll all agree that 15 minutes of daily coaching is what we need to do to develop people's creativity and their ability to use the Toyota Way Lean principles to strive towards service excellence because that's exactly what our customers need and our organizations need to flourish, thrive, and grow for the long term. So, Mark, I'm going to pass it back to you. I want to say thank you to everyone again for joining and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great. Well, thanks, Karen. A lot of questions have come in. Uh, I have a couple questions I'm, I'm going to ask, so I'm glad we have a good amount of time for that. And I would encourage people to continue submitting questions in the question box. I have a few quick announcements. Our next webinar is going to be held in about a month, Tuesday, April 25th, the same uh, time slot. Kevin Meyer, who um, I've known as a fellow lean blogger for uh, over a decade now. He is um, one of the partners in Gemba Academy, and uh, he is the author of a book, The Simple Leader. So he's going to be doing a webinar titled Personal Leadership at the Nexus of Lean and Zen. I, I think a really uh, interesting, kind of uh, thought-provoking, mind-stretching topic. We say nexus, um, the, you know, connections. That's where our name Kai Nexus comes from, from Kaizen and uh, Nexus. So uh, I like this theme, really interested in uh, what Kevin is going to have to say. So you can register for this if you go to kinexus.com slash webinars. Greg Jacobson, um, our co-founder and CEO of Kinexus, he and I are going to do another Ask Us Anything um, live video webinar. It's going to be um, next week, April 4th, um, you can register and submit questions for us at kinexus.com slash webinars. You can find past episodes in this series on our YouTube channel along with a lot of our um, past webinars. Um, if you go to kinexus.com, we do have our uh, on-demand library of past webinars from uh, the past few years, combination of great authors and outside experts like Karen, um, some of our customers, um, I've got some uh, webinars in there, some of our other Kinexus team members. We would encourage you to check those all out, they're free. We have our Kinexus blog at blog.kinexus.com. You can uh, subscribe to get those sent to you via email. We have uh, a podcast series at kinexus.com slash podcasts. We put our webinar recordings in there. Um, we do a lot of 
audiobook versions of blog posts and other conversations and discussions there. You can find that anywhere you find uh, podcasts. And here is Karen's contact um, information. Um, I encourage you to visit her website, KarenRossConsulting.com. Here's her email address. You can find her on Twitter. And I uh, would encourage you um, to check out her book. Again, it's titled The Toyota Way to Service Excellence. All right, so we have a lot of questions um, to choose from. Um, Karen, first question I wanted to ask, you know, around this I can't language. You know, Toyota as a manufacturer isn't able to provide every product or feature or service that customers might want. Do you have any lessons from them about how they choose the right mix of things to actually offer? Are there times they have to say no? Or how are they being creative in um, kind of stretching the boundaries of what customers want? Sure. And I think that Toyota is a great example of invention is the mother of necessity thinking. So Toyota spends a great, great um, deal of time deeply understanding their customers' needs. And I think back to uh, the story in one of Jeff's books about um, the uh, well, one of the Toyota executives driving all of, you know, driving the Sienna minivan <laughs> all around, you know, in different 50 states to see the handling, to see what they, uh, you know, do, but how, how their customers would have that experience. And then when we look at Toyota's guiding principles and values, what they're trying to accomplish in the world, right, respect for people, they're looking to make the world a better place. And now if you look at their mission, they're focused on um, mobility. They don't even say cars anymore. So I myself drive a lovely Toyota Camry hybrid and they had um, first hybrid technology. How do we actually think about what customers might want before customers might even know that they want that? Do I want to drive a car that's better for the environment? Absolutely. Does it have unbelievably fabulous gas mileage as well? Absolutely, I'm driving 50 miles a gallon. I'm hardly ever putting gas in. That is a luxury experience at a coach price for me mm -hmm. uh, as well. So I think when you think about I can't thinking, we think about each customer request is can we do this, yes or no, we can't do this. We have to think about it in a broader perspective. Underlying that customer's request what is it that they have a deep need for? What is it that they're looking for? Is it that they're looking for better environmental sustainability? Is it that they're looking for more convenience? And then how do we address that in a creative way? Okay, thanks. We have a question from Patrick here who asks, in the daily 15-minute coaching, who comes up with the issue? How does a coach come up with different things to challenge the coachee every day? I'm going to say that um, when I'm working with people, we start in a variety of different places of coaching. And it's easy to get stuck on, we need to choose the perfect thing. So the coach might be working on working with a business area and they might be working with frontline people. We can start there. When we start to think about solving one problem, and in general it starts with an idea about problem solving, we can work on this one small thing. And then we can challenge people to think about, okay, if we solve this problem this way, what are the many different possibilities? We then can ask out the broader question, as people get more comfortable, is this way of thinking only about solving this one problem actually even the right way to think? Is saying, okay, we want to um, reduce the number of defects by 50%, is that actually the right thing to think about? Or should we be thinking about how do we, how do we work so that none of our customers ever receives a defect. So that's the way that I would do it, and we just teach people that thinking in little teeny tiny mm. increments. 
It can also work the other way around because sometimes I'm working with a business leader and we might start by thinking about and having the question, well, what's your vision for service excellence? And our 15-minute coaching sessions might be around, okay, we don't have a vision for 15. Mm. You know, we don't have a vision for <laughs> right. service excellence. And that, might, that might take more than 15 minutes to develop, right? <laughs> Correct. And But I, in general, use the same process. So, mm. okay, write me your first draft, and I'll come back tomorrow, and we'll take a look at it. And yeah. it just works the other way. So we really need to tailor our approach to the starting point that we have because the most important thing is to start. You, there's nothing that's yes. preventing you other than the I can'ts in your own well, mind. Greg, yeah, Greg Jacobson and I have done a, a webinar before. We've talked about how do you start with continuous improvement? You, you need to start. Um, but I love the way you said, you know, having a coach gives that borrowed courage because you know, we're, we're, we're empathetic that people are afraid to try, they're afraid they might fail, and I, I think that goes to show the, the, the need for a coach. Yes, and I think that's a very uh, common human response. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've found, and this is especially when we're sent to coach um, higher level leaders who might have a fancy title like senior vice president or CEO after their name is that we think that somehow after we've given them those fancy letters after their name, that they're going to respond or behave differently than any than other human beings. Mm. But we need to remember that before anything else, they're simply human beings. And to change their behavior is exactly the same amount difficult as it is for the rest of us. And in fact, it may be even more difficult because through successive promotion and reinforcement mm -hmm. of a different kind of behavior, it actually might be even more difficult for them to change. So we must be empathetic. Oftentimes as coaches, we're fabulous at the challenge part. Mm -hmm. We push people out into the uncomfortable learning zone <laughs> and we say, great, I'm going to come back in a week and you should have figured this out. You should be at root cause by now. And we come back and we find out there aren't, they aren't there and we're shocked. But we've yeah. missed the nurture part, yeah. the support part. We're all human beings. And when you think about your coaching as part of a peak service experience, you need to have that personal, human, caring connection as well. Yes. Okay, we've got some other questions here related to um, coaching. Um, Keith asked, do you have any thoughts on individual coaching sessions versus team coaching? Would team coaching sessions generate even more ideas and foster teamwork? I am going to say um, that the answer to that question is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on uh, the situation. I, in general, like to start with an individual coaching session because in an individual coaching session I get to build a relationship with that person being coached. However, that's not to say that when we work with a team we don't have many divergent possibilities. So as you can see in the example um, with National Taxi Limo, Joe went back and he talked to his partners. And we did sometimes also once a week we would have a group session together with all of the partners. So I think it really depends, but I do like to start with that personal session so that we build a relationship and the person that I'm coaching, um, I get to know them very well, they get to know me very well, and they get to borrow my courage, and then we can work out from there. Mm -hmm. Let's see, another question. Um, what if the answer to the question, what are possible ways we can solve this issue, is I can't see any after we've dived a few layers down from the initial issue? That's a very good question. And I would say that falls into the category of your person you're coaching being in the uncomfortable zone. And when we're in the uncomfortable learning zone, there's really only two ways for a person to respond. And this is how, as a coach, you know you've actually challenged your learner and coachee into that uncomfortable zone. One, there is some kind of 
fight response, which might be the person argues with me, right? So you might get the response, no, no, that's impossible. There are absolutely no ways. Um, the other is flight. So we only, when we're uncomfortable as human beings, we only have fight or flight. So when you get flight, the other flight could be, that's not possible, I'm not even going sure. to think of that. Mm -hmm. Those are great responses. So when you hear and see that as a coach, you can think, my person is ready to learn. In that situation, what I will do is I will say, hmm, really? Well, why don't you, you know, we're at the end of our session. Why don't you just think about it and come back to me tomorrow? You can go and talk to other people. Why don't you ask the question to, you know, a few other people? See what they come up with because they have experiences too in general. What happens is that people go away, they think about it, their tension level reduces, and they come back tomorrow with some ideas. If that doesn't work, then what I would suggest is we follow the tried and true basic very first principle of Toyota Way and Lean, which is to go with your coachee to the Gemba. Mm -hmm where whatever it is that's occurring and see with them because then you can actually help push them because probably you're going to be able to see a variety of possibilities. Thanks, Karen. Um, quick update. Somebody had uh, pulled the and on cord and pointed out that our webinars page did not yet have a registration link for the April webinar that has now been updated. So thank you for pulling the and on cord and you can now go to kinexus.com slash webinars and sign up for both of our April events. Um, another question for you, Karen. What if the solutions to our challenge is out of our control, such as changing performance management practices in a large organization to encourage team motivation? What if okay, things are out I of just, our control? I've just heard and I can't. So how, I do, you, how do you address that? Right, so the question is, in our own thinking, oftentimes, we hear, well, it's out of our control. But are things really out of our control? Or are things actually in our control in a variety of different ways? Could we not actually start a dialogue with someone in the performance management area? Could we not make the problem visible to an executive who might have influence that we don't? A lot of the, when we think about A3 problem solving, a lot of that was touting your A3 around your paper and pencil A3 and going and talking to a lot of people and hearing a lot of people's um, ideas about what was possible and what is not possible. So when we start to do that and we start to socialize different ideas and thinking, things start to happen. They may not happen tomorrow. They may not happen overnight, but we can break those things down into what seems out of control, into what seems in control. So maybe we can find a way to do a small test of a different type of performance management in a small area so that we can see the different result. So I will say, again, I'm not a believer in I can't. Mm -hmm. The question is how? So if things seem out of our control, what is it? And this is the question I would, I would ask. What is it that makes you feel that that is out of your control. Mm -hmm. And the other question is, what is it that, um, even if it's out of control, prevents us from trying or testing or doing something different on a small scale here? Okay, um, to this point of the I can'ts, this um, is a, a question, kind of more of a comment from Sergey, who says, um, when a person says there's no way to solve it, I usually ask a question similar to, what are the ways to solve the problem you would never consider using? Which I think is, that sounds like an interesting way to stretch thinking, right? Absolutely. I love that. Again, it's a way to ask people to see that the barrier, in a way, is in their mind, right? There's some other possibility. We've just chosen yeah. not to do it. Okay, a couple, we'll try to rapid fire a few questions here to get them in. Um, do the materials provided for the webinar include the terms divergent thinking, other things you mentioned? So um, do you have resources, or I guess part of the answer is 
uh, is in your book, The Toyota Way to Service Excellence, or what do you recommend, what can we share about divergent thinking? Um, I'm going to say that this little portion of creativity probably isn't in Toyota Way to Service Excellence, but whoever, um, if they have questions and need further resources, please certainly reach out to um, me. A lot of these things are my own definitions, and I'm happy to um, send information and have a dialogue with anybody who has a question at any time and wants further information. Okay, and I, I can grab uh, the email address of the person who asked that, so we can try to follow up. Um, there's a question from Matt. Um, great presentation. Thanks for your time and support. The question I have is, when you work with organizations, do you encourage your work with service excellence to be integrated with strategic planning and continuous improvement? And how transparent are organizations with these efforts in your experience? Okay, so I am going to say that's a wonderful question. And the answer is yes, because most of the organizations that I work with, if I ask them a question, do you have a vision of service excellence? Even though they're a service organization, one would expect them to say yes. In general, the answer is often no, because service has become a byproduct of something else, because they become internally focused. So working to make this vision transparent and then to have people understand that Toyota Way Lean isn't different than customer experience. It's not different than strategic planning. It's not different than any of these other things of continuous improvement. The reason lean exists isn't as an end in itself, but as a means to create and deliver what customers want when they want it right the first time mm -hmm. at the cost that they want it and in a safe and, uh, way and engaging way for the people who do the work. So the challenge is actually to make, not make any of these things extra and separate add-ons. And um, whoever sent that question, if they want reading the Toyota Way to Service Excellence, I think will really make that clear. The book covers all of those. Okay, um, another question from ASOC here uh, on the slide with how to coach your creativity. Uh, is it possible to remotely coach via go to meeting or other methods rather than being at the Gemba? Um, I actually do that all the time and I have uh, clients who are in many parts of the world. I'm going to say in my experience, if you can make a Gemba visit first and really see, if not, we have fabulous technology now, FaceTime, Skype, Someone can hold up their phone and you can be in Gemba. So absolutely. Okay, and then um, final question. Do you use question thinking approaches in your practice to increase creativity? So I guess your own creativity, Karen. Do you ever find yourself coaching yourself, catching yourself in an I can't moment? Uh, absolutely, and um, just like anybody else, I actually have many coaches <laughs> who I am very happy to say when I am talking to them I will just hear the unpleasant voice sometimes of my coach saying I think I'm hearing and I can't aren't you the person who believes <laughs> who doesn't believe and I can't so yes I'm a human being too and we all need a coach at least one and we all should be coaching someone and we can all develop our creativity and our ability to deliver those peak service experiences our customers want. That is a wonderful question. Thank you. Well, and a wonderful answer and a wonderful webinar, and we are wonderfully up against the top of the hour. So um, we'll have to go ahead and wrap up. Um, on behalf of the team at Kinexus, I want to thank you, Karen, for um, giving your time today to do this webinar to get us thinking about our own creativity. Um, I would encourage everyone to check out KarenRossConsulting.com to learn more about Karen, her work, her book, and uh, all of that. So again, Karen, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for everybody on today's call. I appreciate it. Yes, thanks for attending, and hopefully we will see you next time.